let's talk about SHA-256. Before we jump into all of the details, we're going to get to what SHA-256 is, um, how we use it in the real world, and even a bit of the kind of low-level implementation details, right? How it works under the hood. But before we do that, I want to just show you what it is. So I wrote a little SHA-256 you know, generator um, on my blog. So that's where we are. And um, it, it's really simple, right? You can type in some input. So I'll just type in hello world. You can run the SHA-256 hash and get this kind of giant string of letters and numbers as output. One of the interesting things about SHA-256 is that given the same input, it will always produce exactly the same output. So I'll link to this SHA-256 generator down in the description below. But my point is, if you were to type in hello world on your own computer, you would get the exact same result, right? I can sit here and hash hello world over and over again, and I'm just getting the same, the same thing. But if I change just one letter in the input, the output changes dramatically, right? It didn't just change by one character. It changed, like everything changed. It seemingly changed in a random and complete way. And, and that's really important because one of the uh, kind of properties of a strong cryptographic hashing function like SHA-256 is that if you only have access to the output, the input should be unguessable. Right, so if, if I give you this SHA-256 string, there should be no way for you to guess that hello worlds was the input string. So as we just saw, the purpose of SHA-256 is really to generate these, we call them fingerprints, right? So given some input string, right? Like hello world, like we just saw. When we hash it, we get some output string. Right, A, B, one, two, blah, blah, blah. It's really long. This we call the input. I'll label it in blue. Put. And then obviously on the other side we have the output, but we also kind of we also kind of nickname it the fingerprint. Fingerprint. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense, right? We mentioned how given the same input, the output will always be the same. It works the same way with fingerprints, right? When we take our fingerprints or when the police take our fingerprints, right? The only, the only reason they're doing that is because your fingerprints are always the same. If someone finds your fingerprint, they know you were there. Similarly, with SHA-256, if someone sees a fingerprint that maps to a, a certain input and they see that fingerprint again, they can be sure that the input was the same. SHA-256 is a hash function. And it's not the only hash function out there, um, but it is a very popular one. And we'll get to um, kind of in a minute how SHA-256 is different from other hash functions and what makes it special and great and all those things. Um, but for now, let's just talk about what a hash function is in the first place. All right, so what is a hash? All right, hash functions have kind of three properties. Um, and the first is that they scramble data. They scramble data deterministically. I'll just put DET. And this is kind of what we already went over, right? We, we have some input, right? In this case, hello world. And that information is scrambled up into kind of this, you know, 256-bit output, this fixed length kind of large, seemingly random output. But what's interesting is that it's not actually random, right? Uh, deterministic is basically just the opposite of random. If given the exact same input, then the exact same fingerprint will always be generated. So it's scrambling the input in the same way every time, right? If we change the input, of course, we get a different output. But for the same input, the output will always be the same. The second property of a hash function is that the output is always of a fixed size. We'll just put fixed size output. So that means we can feed in the letter H, right? One single character as input, and we will get 256, 256 bits um, of output data or, you know, as the length of that, that fingerprint. Um, or we could feed in the entire series of Lord of the Rings novels, and we'll still just get that same 256-bit fingerprint. So no matter what the size of the input, the output will always be of a fixed length. The third most important thing um, for a hash function to do is to be irreversible. Irreversible. That is hard, hard spelling for me. 
irreversible. So that means if I'm given a fingerprint, just a fingerprint, then I should have no way to reverse the function and figure out what the input was, right? So when we talk about scrambling deterministically, we really emphasize the scrambling part, right? Um, if just one letter changes in the input, right? If just one letter changes over here, we should get an entirely new, very different digest so that, again, given just a digest, there's no way for us to reverse it. And this is an important cryptographic principle. Actually, crypto systems like Bitcoin, right? Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin rely on this because publicly the fingerprints of private information are being published publicly, right? On the public blockchain. And so if, if the fingerprints were able to be reversed, funds would be at stake. So this irreversibility of a hash function is critically important. So what makes SHA-256 special and unique, right? We know that all hash functions kind of have those three properties that we talked about. Let's talk about some stuff specific to SHA-256. Um, the first thing, the first thing it, is that SHA-256 has a 256 bit, bit output length. Right. So it's true that all hash functions must have a fixed length output, um, but SHA-256 just happens to be exactly 256 bits. So that's clearly something that's specific to it. The next important thing is that SHA-256 is still considered, still considered secure. Okay, so there are other secure hash functions out there. This just means that the hash function hasn't been found to have any exploitable vulnerabilities, right? So SHA-256 is still very secure um, as opposed to, say, SHA... SHA-1 or MD-5, right? MD-5 and SHA-1 have both um, been broken pretty, pretty critically. Um, there's different ways that a hash function can break, but in, in the case of SHA-1 and MD-5, um, the problem was that uh, researchers have found ways to kind of create collisions. In other words, um, kind of create different inputs that are known to create the same fixed fingerprint. And if you, again, kind of think back to the analogy of the police, you can see how that would be problematic, right? There's essentially a way to spoof fingerprints at a crime scene, right? Uh, you, you have someone commit a crime there and you're able to kind of swap out the data so it looks like somebody else committed the crime. Uh, the same thing was able to happen with SHA-1 and MD-5. You're able to kind of create the fingerprint that you want, which is problematic for a number of scenarios that we'll get to in just a second when we talk about kind of the real world use cases of SHA-256 and other, other hash functions. The last one that's really worth pointing out here is that SHA-256 is very fast, right? Like I can SHA-256 hash an entire novel in seconds, much less than seconds actually, almost instantaneously. Um, and that's important for a lot of scenarios, but basically anytime we're trying to hash large amounts of data, SHA-256 is a great option just because of how fast it works. Now, it's important to point out that because it's fast, it's not good at some other things. Specifically, it's not good at hashing passwords of user accounts and databases. Um, in fact, you want those hash functions to be fairly slow. And that's so that when an attacker tries to generate many hashes at the same time, they have to spend lots of electricity and energy computing those hashes. Um, but that's not a property that every hash function wants. And so again, SHA-256 is a great use case when fast hashing is something that you want. So let's talk about some real world use cases. Um, one of the most prevalent use cases is kind of in anti antiviruses. So how does this work? Well, when you create a program, let's just say Microsoft Word, for example, so we've got word.exe, right? Which is just this kind of giant bundle of data that a computer can use to open the Microsoft Word application and run it. Um, that will typically be published alongside right, word.exe word plus some fingerprint. And then what happens is when you download word.exe, at the same time, you're downloading the fingerprint onto your own computer. And then what your computer kind of does automatically without you maybe necessarily realizing it is that it runs a hash function on 
the Microsoft Word executable and ensures that the executable matches the published fingerprint, right? That Microsoft essentially said, this is the official fingerprint for Microsoft Word. If they don't match, right? So if, if we download word.exe and we, we run it through, run it through a hash function, hash it, right? And the output fingerprint, if that does not match, let's use blue, if that does not match, right, not equal to the fingerprint that we downloaded, right, if that's not equal to this fingerprint that we downloaded, then we know that we have a tampered with version of Microsoft Word, right? If the fingerprints do match, then we know that the one that we downloaded is the official version. So fingerprints, and, and SHA-256 uh, in particular is used for this a lot, um, are, are used to kind of detect and ensure that programs that we are downloading on the internet don't contain viruses or additional pieces of logic that could be doing you know, malicious things. Another way that SHA-256 and hash functions are used in the real world is with authentication or auth. Right? So when you go to a website and type in a username and password, you want to be able to log into the site and kind of from there on out, be able to act as um, someone who's logged into the site, right? You don't want to have to log in every time you want to do something um, interesting. You kind of log in once and then you are authenticated. So the way that authentication process happens um, oftentimes involves a hash function. Um, let's talk about how that works. So for example, let's say you want to log into boot, boot.dev. What happens is you put in your username and password and boot.dev goes and checks their database and says, are these the, the right usernames and passwords? If they are, they're then going to want to issue you a token. And the way they issue that token is typically like this. They'll take some identifying piece of information, maybe a user ID, maybe a username. Let's just say a username for now to keep it simple. They'll take your username and they'll append that so maybe they do like username dot, right? This is, you could just think of this as a, a string of text, your username dot, and then some token. And the way the token is generated is actually by using a SHA-256 hash function on some, some data that we'll put here in the parentheses. So token equals SHA-256. And, and typically what's done here is they will hash two important pieces of information. They'll hash your username, but they'll append to your username a secret key. Secret key. And this secret key is specific to boot.dev. It's something they keep secret on their servers, right? So they're able to generate this token and then they're able to give you this kind of concatenated thing and you're able to use that to authenticate yourself later. So on every subsequent request that your browser sends to the website, you include this username and token, and the boot.dev website can use that to check that you are, you say who you are. And the way that that works is actually really simple. When you make your request and you send back this token, boot.dev says, okay, well, here's the username. So this person is trying to act as, say, you know, Wags Lane. That's usually the username that I use, right? Lane Wagner. And then they'll take the token and they'll say, okay, well, let's hash the username, right? So Wags Lane with our secret key and see if we get the same token that this user is giving us back in the request. And if it matches, then boot dev is able to be sure. They're able to be sure that they created that authentication token and that it wasn't created by a hacker or spoofed. Right? And this is important because no one else has their key. And in this scheme, they never have to give out their key to us as a user. So we're not able to use that key for anything malicious. So by using an irreversible SHA-256 hash function, they're able to create this authentication scheme that works. Now, I will say it's, it's worth pointing out that here I'm doing a lot of hand waving. This isn't literally how it works and there, there are a few more details um, that are important but from a high level this is how it works um, things like jwts right uh, mac 
right? Authentication codes, HMAX. Just throwing out some buzzwords now. Um, all, all of these are technologies uh, that use hash functions under the hood to kind of make sure um, that the authentication schemes can, can work correctly. So while you definitely should not go build from scratch an authentication scheme that works based on this kind of you know simple uh, hashing, know that this is the basic idea that underlines some um, well-standardized practices um, that, that real authentication schemes that are used in production are, are built on top of. So another way in which SHA-256 is used in the real world is with blockchains. Block. In fact, Bitcoin, kind of the biggest and most popular blockchain, uh, uses SHA-256 as its hashing algorithm. There are other blockchains that use other algorithms, but Bitcoin does use SHA-256. Okay, so let's start. Um, I'm going to try to give just like a really simple um, overview of how a blockchain works. So we've got all these blocks, and in each block, there are a bunch of transactions, right? So maybe in this first block that let's just say this is the present. This is the present here. So six blocks ago, which in the case of Bitcoin, each block represents 10 minutes of transactions. So this would be one hour ago. We have the first transaction, like John sent, you know, two Bitcoins to Alice, and then Bob sent three Bitcoins to John and uh, so on and so forth. So we get all these transactions. So these blocks are filled up with transactions. Well, in a blockchain, we hash the data within a block to create a fingerprint, right? So we hash this block and we get some fingerprint. The interesting thing is that when we hash the next block, we always include the fingerprint of the previous block as an input to the SHA-256 hash function. So for example, when we take the fingerprint of this block, we use the data from the block itself, but also the data from the previous fingerprint to produce a new fingerprint. And that's important because it means if either someone tries to change the transaction data in this block, or they try to change this fingerprint or, or this uh, transaction data in this block, it will change this new fingerprint, right? So we do this kind of up through the chain, creating new fingerprints. And it's important to understand that in blockchains, it's really expensive to generate new blocks. So if an attacker wants to swap out a transaction from a block that happened, say, five blocks ago, if they change that data, it will change this fingerprint, which will in turn change every fingerprint that comes after it, right? Remember in SHA-256, if you change what, just one character, it drastically changes uh, kind of the output fingerprint. So what this means is kind of the longer a block has been in the blockchain, right? The more blocks that come after it, the harder it is for that transaction to be reversed, right? In, in terms of Bitcoin, it's very expensive um, kind of when we we're talking about like the cost of electricity in order to generate these blocks. Um, so SHA-256 is what makes it easy for all the participants in the network to make sure that no one is changing anything kind of outside of the rules of, of, of how the blockchain works. So hopefully this helps you understand SHA-256 um, at least from a pretty high level, right? Understand um, what the properties of the hash function are and when it's used in the real world. If you're curious about how it works under the hood, like how the bits are moved from the input to generate a digest, then I will link to my blog post that goes over all of that in excruciating detail uh, down below in the description. Um, so check that out if that's interesting to you. If you'd like to see more videos like this, feel free to subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, click the bell. You know the things. Um, please do the things.